Hello, welcome to Understanding A Course in Miracles. So in 1976, at a party in California, Helen Schuckman, the scribe of A Course in Miracles, gave what is believed to be her only recorded interview. And it's a fascinating insight into her experience of receiving the material for the course. And people often describe A Course in Miracles as a channeled work, but from the way that she describes the process, this wasn't a channeled work in the usual sense. It wasn't automatic writing, and her body wasn't being used to communicate the material other than to hear what was being said and to write it down. And she wasn't in a trance when she received the material and could do it around the daily activities of her life. For example, while she was riding in her cab or in between tutoring students and so on. So much has been written about A Course in Miracles and about Helen Schuckman, but this interview is a rare opportunity where we get to hear from the lady herself in her own words. Regarding the voice you heard in describing A Course in Miracles, does it come from outside or from within? There's nothing that I would call ordinary audition about this at all. It doesn't really... It's a curious thing and it will be very difficult to explain. Somebody asked me, was it as though your hand was moving? No, I wrote perfectly voluntarily in response to... I call it a voice, but a voice has sounds or sounds as though it has something to do with hearing. I didn't hear anything. I think it's a sort of hearing that you can't really describe. It doesn't have anything to do with ears or waves hitting a drum or anything on that order. I don't really know. I think maybe I'm using the wrong word when I say hear. I sort of recognized it. It was very rapid. I could even, if I didn't catch a phrase, I could sort of say, would you mind doing that again? You know. This was in your mind? This is strictly mental. Otherwise, I would consider it hallucinatory activity. I don't feel it was that. Is it comparable to anything in terms of how we hear ourselves talk or like you talk to yourself? It wasn't my voice. It couldn't have been because it talked about a whole area with which I am entirely unfamiliar. What about subvocalizing? When you're subvocalizing, you're, you're hearing the words. You're actually hearing them. No, there's no vocalization. It's a process that I, I, I really would find impossible to explain. It's never happened to me before. I don't have any knowledge of the area so that I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to say like X or whatever mm -hmm. it is because I wouldn't know what X did. You could hear the words clearly in your mind even though you didn't hear a sound? I knew that that was the word. I think knew may be a better word mm -hmm. than heard. I did not know consciously at the beginning of the sentence how it was going to end, and that puts me under a further handicap in terms of ordinary language, because ordinarily, if, if, I think, if, if you're going to say a sentence, you know what it's going to be, you sort of get the gestalt immediately. But I didn't, and it, it came very easily, very rapidly, very smoothly, I guess even painlessly, except that it annoyed me to death, but that's irrelevant. I guess here isn't the right word. I could stop any time or pick it up any time. And I did it in cabs and subways and anything. Or sort of between telephone calls. But you're raising a, a question I, I don't think, Dave, I can answer. Yeah. I really am trying. So a certain mechanism went on there. Because you heard something, you translated it into the shorthand style. Yes, but I'm so used to shorthand. I use it for group therapy sessions. So that shorthand is quite familiar to me. So you don't even uh, it, it's really a matter of speed. So you really I, I couldn't have kept up with it in ordinary writing. Oh, you couldn't? Oh, no, it's very rapid. I needed the shorthand. What about automatic writing? A thing when pen takes over and writes for the person. The person doesn't have any control. Is that similar to what you're describing? No, that didn't happen at all. No. I could have stopped at any kind, and I frequently did. I and I was very frequently interrupted, so that I would have to stop there. I, I didn't lose awareness of where I was or what I was doing. My interns kept barging in for therapy sessions. Now, Bill always says, well, I'm just naturally dissociated, which I never take as a compliment. But maybe it's that. 
And I think in a sense it must be, because I haven't caught up with it yet. And I, I don't understand it, and I still feel very baffled by it. And I'm also still just a little uncomfortable with the material, but I'm getting used to it now. And I'm also getting used to a feeling that it, that it was the right thing to have done. The only curious thing that I do know, and this is curious, I am used to doing pretty much what I want to, and I do make my own decisions. But for some reason or other, it never occurred to me not to do this. I thought that this should be done. I made every effort to keep it without me. I did not want to intrude on it, and I felt that it was a matter of personal integrity not to. I really did not interfere with it. I think the thing that I found upsetting about it was it went against everything I believed, which is very hard to do. But I felt it was much more important. I know what I believe, but I didn't know what this was going to do next. And I was very pleased with its coherence and with its being very consistent, which is something that I would regard as, as a mandatory criterion. It read very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know the pain with which I managed to get something to read halfway as well as that, which is very agonizing. And this came out very quickly, talked about a system I don't know anything about, and confused me no end. I'm still cross-eyed. That's all I can really say about it. You tried to edit it at times, didn't you? Yes, I did. It would bother me, and I would never forget what it was originally. And I would feel kind of uneasy about it. But since I do so much editing, I figured, well, I'm improving this, you know, and that's it. But then later, when it would pick it up again and refer back to that, then it would be inconsistent because it would use the original word. So then I very quickly learned, don't do that because you will interfere with the internal consistency. So then I stopped doing that. Very quickly I learned that that was a very bad mistake. So we went back and we changed all the words back into its original form. Did you remember the word? Or did you have to go back and just ask at the time? And I used to tell Bill that used to be, you know, whatever it was. But sometimes, I wouldn't say more than two or three times, I didn't know. But I was aware that there was a goof off in through there, and I would feel the goof off more than the, the right answer. And then I, I would sort of look at a blackboard so in my head and see it written the word it should have been. And I would ask, would, can I see it on the blackboard? You would ask and also see it? Yes, if, if I was undecided. I'd forgotten to mention that. Would there also be that knowingness that accompanies it like? No, then I would be reading it, but on the blackboard I would see it in letters. Then it was a very visual thing in your mind. And then it was visual. Ordinarily it isn't. But I think that that modality had to come in where I had kind of lost my way in it, and I really didn't know what the word should be. Could you close this off any time you didn't want to hear or do it? Oh, yes. In other words, it was strictly your option. Oh, very much, except that it kind of nudges me if I don't, if I didn't do it. When I, when I was sort of supposed to, sometimes I couldn't sleep, and then I would become very restless, and at one point I didn't do it for about three weeks. I felt quite pushed around by this, and enough is enough. And it, it was kind of a rough, rough three weeks. But I didn't know when it was finished, and I didn't know when I was supposed to stop. The course came first. Well, uh, the text is is the, what what we originally would had called the course. The Thank text you. is the right is the right word. For it. Uh -huh. That came first, and that was through. I think there was something like a three month hiatus. You had no urge to write then? A, a while before I started in again, I, I said to Bill and also to Jonathan, I have a horrible feeling there's a workbook that goes with this, but maybe it's just a, you know, maybe I'm going to be let off on this one. But I, I did know it, and it, it became increasingly clear that that was it. And I knew at that time there would also be a teacher's manual, because that's obviously what professors have to teach with. Mm -hmm. And I did feel that it was going to organize itself in that way. And uh, Do you feel that it's over now? I think so. I think so. The only thing that I might be able to do, although I would hesitate to do it, because 
I feel very strongly that my commitment included having nothing to do with anything psychic. I feel that very strongly. I think I, I told you the story of the original commitment in that line. If I didn't, it's in my no. autobiography and you'll see. No. Uh, I think it's through. I do think, and under certain circumstances, I might be able to do this and might want to, if it were very helpful to somebody. I think there are questions I could probably write an answer to. But I think I, I would really want to do that, not as a, as a major part of anything, because I don't think it's very important, but if someone were in trouble and it would be helpful, I might try to do it. I haven't had any occasion yet. So you continue to hear the voice. Oh, no, I could ask what to do about something, particularly if the three of us are together. And we would ask, and we would get an answer. We generally get the same answer. If we don't, we'll sort of feel somebody's off a little bit, and we'll try again. But we generally do. According to the course, we should, and everyone could, ask about anything and get an answer. Sometimes it's very surprising to me, and one of the things that I think we mistakenly do is to figure, oh, well, this is unimportant, or this is, you know, this, or to cut out certain areas from the process of asking, which I'm sure is a mistake, because I don't think we should evaluate. I think you can ask anything, and I would doubt very much if anything is likely to happen to me that wouldn't happen to anybody else, if he wanted it to. I mean, or, or if he felt this was the way he wanted to go. I can't imagine that. In fact, I'm sure it isn't true. Of course, it's rather explicit on that. So you do hear now and then? I hear whenever I ask. In other words, at this point now, it's really a matter of asking. Well, now it's a little more a question of personal guidance as to what to do. We didn't know whether we were supposed to come here, for example, so we asked about that. And we all three thought we should come to California. This was not where we intended to go. Uh, and we did feel that Judy sort of came, you know, at a particular time. We, we felt very much that she was an integral part of this. But we asked for this because I've been very, very careful about this. I am a very careless person in some ways. I lose everything. But I never lost anything of this course. People would stop me in the subway and say, Miss, you forgot your something or other and hand it back to me. Taxis would honk their horns, you know, say you left something in the back seat. My secretary would say, you sure this belongs in this case report? It doesn't sound right. <laughs> and I, it was impossible to lose this course, and I tried. Mm. Uh, but it sort of kind of followed me around in, in, in an odd kind of way. People would send it back to me, anything, you know, and I, I always got it back. And we never lost anything, which is incredible for me. You have to know me because I, I really do lose anything. We once went to a, a game thing, you know, where you had a guess from a one-sentence thing who it was. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, my God, where is it? And the whole, the whole uh, faculty said, Helen Shuckman. They recognized it immediately. I'm better now. I think this has been a good experience. You're the absent-minded professor type? No more. Now I'm just absent-minded. I found that interview really fascinating. So some of the things I found interesting about this interview was Helen Shuckman's description of the speed of the communication that was coming through and how she wouldn't have been able to keep up with it if she wasn't using shorthand. And also how occasionally the material came to her visually and that she would see the words in her mind's eye on a blackboard. That's also how the material went against everything she believed in. This suggests that the material wasn't just coming from an unconscious part of her own personality, as some people have suggested, which implies that it was coming from something or someone else. I particularly like the part where she said, I have a horrible feeling there's a workbook that goes with this. 
anyway, this was a fascinating insight from Professor Helen Shuckman, the reluctant mystic, into how A Course in Miracles came into existence.